thanks very much for the kind invitation. I'm sorry I cannot be there, but um, I say it's for certainly a privilege to be here to share with you my ideas about this uh, anomalous or origin of Korean arteries. So I have no disclosures. So first of all, the anomalous origin of coronary arteries is a rare anatomical abnormality. That's the most important. So it's pretty, pretty rare. However, we have been so interested in this because uh, some high-risk anomalies can cause sudden death in um, active young people. So the situation can be very dramatic. What is the anomalous aortic origin of coronary arteries? Let's try to clarify what we're talking about. Um, there have been different kinds of uh, acronyms. One of the first were the anomalous coronary artery origin from the opposite sinus by Paolo Angelini from Houston. Uh, um, afterwards, from Philadelphia, anomalous coronary artery from the contralateral sinus. As you can see, these two first definitions are referring to the most common uh, kind of anomalies, but they are not actually talking about all the kind of anomalies. They did not include all the peculiarities of this kind of anomalies. So most recently from uh, Julie Brothers from Philadelphia, the acronym that we use more uh, often and uh, more commonly is the name of anomalous aortic origin of coronary artery. What is not? The, ano the anomalous origin of coronary artery from the pulmonary artery is not included in this kind of anomalies. We do not refer to a coronary artery to RV fistula or aneurysm of the right coronary artery in patients with um, pulmonary atresia and interventricular sector. Uh, we do not refer to myocardial bridge. Myocardial bridge is another anatomical uh, entity that must be considered differently. And uh, we don't talk about hostile atresia, which can affect more either the right or the left coronary artery. So uh, the, the, interest, the interest that we have in this kind of anomaly is that the significant clinical manifestation are mostly related to exertion uh, related transient myocardial ischemia. So this patient can be perfectly asymptomatic, but the first episode, the first clinical symptom may be sudden cardiac death. There are also a lot of debate, as we all know, about indication of a surgical intervention and its effectiveness compared to natural history, since we may find patients who are symptomatic in early, uh, in early infancy or uh, in, a, in, a, in a teenage, or a patient that can uh, naturally uh, live until uh, old age. <clears throat> in addition, the age of diagnosis may change lifestyle, especially if there's young people very active in sports, and sometimes this can, this can push for treatment. Um, as we can see here, normal usual pattern of corners, as we know, is the left corner from the left sinus, the right corner from the right sinus. The most frequent anomaly that we have found in literature at Every, um, almost every experience is the anomalous origin of the right coronary from the left sinus. However, the most little that has been described several times by different pathological groups is the anomalous aortic origin of the left coronary artery from the right sinus. And what is important is not only the, the um, ectopic origin of the ostium, but also and most especially the proximal part of the coronary segment that can be different. Then, as, as you can see in this um, diagram, it can be prepulmonary, so anterior to the pulmonary valve. It can be interarterial, so between the pulmonary artery and the aortic, the, or the aorta. And in this case, the proximal part can be intramural, so running inside the aortic wall, or maybe not intramural. Another interesting entity is the so-called subpulmonic, or most recently we call it intraseptal which is actually the running of the proximal part of the coronary, most often the left coronary, in the subconal, in the subconal septum, just below the pulmonary artery. And then we can have some other more rare case of retroaortic or retrocardiac. The most interesting one for a clinical significance are certainly the interarterial and the intraseptal. Uh, the normal atomic origin <laughs> of the coronary artery is a, as a, to have an exit angle of about 90%. However, we may have abnormal angulated orifice in which the coronary vessels can pass obliquely through the aortic wall through a distance that is equal or inferior to the coronary artery diameter. And as you can see here, the exit angle is less than 90, per 90 degrees. 
And finally, this is the real intramural course. As you can see, the coronary vessels pass through the aortic wall for a distance, A, which is much bigger or than, the, than the coronary artery diameter. And the exit angle here is about zero degree. This is very important anomaly because uh, it's a, probably the, the one which is implicated with the most common um, uh, problem of, ischia, of um, uh, occasional ischemia. It is also demonstrating now that a greater intramural coronary length uh, measured by imaging or at surgery is correlated with preoperative symptoms. What is important in the coronary anomalies, this kind of coronary anomalies, is that the risk of sudden death is actually reflecting a complex interaction between the underlying anatomic morphology, so the intramural course, the osteoma, and then we'll see the typical, all the details of the anatomical morphology, but also the circuital effects of intense physical exertion, which in other words is the change of pressure and the change of distension of the aortic wall. So not only the anatomy of the anomalous aortic origin of coronary arteries where high risk is important, but also the functional behavior during the strenuous exertion. In fact, the geometry of coronary arteries, including also the ostia, can change. So the possible etiologies of sudden cardiac death in this kind of anomalies are the most commonly said and the so scissor-like effect of the interterior segment, which is squeezed by the aortic and pulmonary artery during exertion. This um, but all this etiopathologic or a physiopathologic um, phenomenon is actually probably overestimated. The real recently more attention has been um, has been focused on the, uh, the squeezing of intramural coronary segment, which can occur during an increase in aortic pressure and during the aortic wall distension. But also the orifice of the coronary may be closed by the increased aortic pressure, especially if it's not round, but it's slit line. And uh, how can we diagnose the symptoms? Uh, how can we make diagnosis of, the, of this kind of anomaly? The diagnosis may be uh, given by symptoms, which can occur in about half, may be associated with some congenital artery disease, but most often the diagnosis is incidental. And so the patient may be totally symptomatic. Most often we can diagnose this disease in a young, active, very fit patients who just go for regular follow-up in sport medicine evaluation. How we do diagnosis? Echocardiography is a very nice tool, it's operator dependent, but it has been um, underestimating the incidence and prevalence of early coronary because most often uh, the, um, the regular adult cardiologists were not they were not used to uh, focus on coronaries. So the, the diagnosis was done most often by people who are cardiologists who were more uh, familiar with coronary anomalies in congenital heart disease. So nowadays there are a lot of interest in echocardiography, especially with training of cardiologists, adult cardiologists and every cardiologist now is focusing his attention on the origin of the coronary arteries, also in echocardiography. CT scan is for sure the more objective and more interesting, um, more objective, more uh, reliable tool. Um, cardiac catheterization for diagnosis is not the, 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 the tool nowadays, but it can be associated with the IVUS, intravascular ultrasound, which is uh, pushed by some, some uh, colleagues, and also the calculation of the FFR. But also virtual angioscopy may be, may be very useful to evaluate the, 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 uh, the characteristic anatomy of the, of, the, um, of the hostia. As we can see here, this is the typical CT scan that we can have. We can see the anomaly or the origin of the right coronary. We can see here the lumen of the coronary, which is, um, which is ovalized. We have different reconstruction and also the virtual uh, angioscopy that can make you see the difference between a, 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 a roundish normal ostium and this little like one. Also, most recently, it's important to um, the, the, the fibrosis has been detected in oldest patients. So MRI with late gadolinium enhancement is maybe very important. Again, here we have images of CT scan, the virtual angioscopy, and again we can see the difference between the ovalized intramural um, 
a part of the corn of the coronary and the roundish part of the coronary, which is outside of the, of the wall. <clears throat> also, it's very important to evaluate the location of the ostia, a location in which thymus, but also close to the which, to which commissures and at which height is to be uh, to be uh, to be uh, located. This is very important because it, uh, all these anatomical details um, characterize the high risk anatomy for this kind of anomalies. Again, the nomenclature for the different relationship between the two coronary ostia is pretty important for the evaluation of the high risk anatomy. Anyway, the presence of this anomaly of origin of coronary arteries does not justify on its own the surgical repair. So there should be a proper assessment to establish the appropriate strategy that may or not may or not include the surgical repair. These are some uh, algorithms that are uh, taken from the experience of the Houston Center, which is which I have the most important uh, or, or largest experience uh, worldwide. And as you can see, the cardiology consultation is requiring a, a pretty good number of uh, tests before deciding what to do, independently also on the on the on the um, and depending also on the kind of clinical disorder. And also, it's important that the, the kind of, of disease uh, can be treated differently according to the different anatomy. You see, with the interceptor course or without interceptor course, with vegetal course or other types. This is either for the left or the right coronary. The current recommendation from the European Society of Cardiology from 2020 is actually recommending the surgery only if symptoms and evidence of stress-induced ischemia uh, in a matching territory or high-risk anatomy. So if patients with any kind of uh, anomalous coronary have symptoms or evidence of stress, the uh, surgical repair is recommended. The, all the other time, all the other things, the recommendation is lighter. It should be the, in this um, in these guidelines, the surgical repair is should be considered if there's any anomalous aortic origin or coronary artery with no symptoms, but with evidence of ischemia, or in the left coronary with no symptoms, no ischemia, but with high risk anatomy, but it should be considered. May be considered, so even lower degree, if symptoms with no ischemia, no risk anatomy, in right left coronary anomaly with no symptoms, no ischemia, but age less than 45, is not recommended at all in the right coronary with no symptoms, no risk anatomy, no ischemic sign. So, the, which are the surgical options? The, according to the different kind of anatomy, the one operation doesn't fit all. In fact, the morphology determines the risk, influences the limits and the type of surgical treatment. The most common surgical repair in Europe and in the, in the United States has been for sure the unroofing of, murals, unroofing of the intramural segment, which can be done with the, for the right coronary, but also with the left coronary. Of course, to do an unroofing of the left coronary, of the <clears throat> roofing of the coronary, you must have an um, a intramural segment. The intramural segment may be super commissural, as we demonstrated in this picture, or in some cases, it may be very close to the, to the commissure. And in this case, in this case, the, uh, the roofing has to be performed with the detachment of the commissure, the roofing, and then the re implant of the commissure, which may cause late uh, aortic regurgitation. So for this reason, there may be different kinds of procedures to create, like creating a new ostium in the correct sign, sinus, uh, happening with a probe. And as you can see here, uh, after the, uh, as you can see here, here you can see the uh, small um, uh, right corner with an um, uh, angulated slit like ostium when compared to the left corner. And uh, another thing that we usually do is to tap the, uh, when you open the, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the roof of the coronary, you just tape all the uh, borders to ensure the largest ostium as possible. An underappreciated features of the aortic coronary compass is the so-called intercoronary pillar. This thickening tissue uh, that goes cranially to the, from the intercoronary commissure to the sinal tubular junction. This may be pretty thick in some patients. And uh, this pillar 
contributes to the support of the aortic valve. However, this is important to note when you do an arbufen because of the, for this reason. As you can see here, if you have the inter, if you have the, uh, a long intramural segment with a uh, intercoronary pillar, which is pretty, pretty thick, if you do the unroofing with a long tract of intramural segment, you can just obtain a pretty good result with a large osteum and so a large and nice perfusion of the coronary. On the other side, if the, if the intramural segment is short, the intracoronary pillar can press and can reduce the effectiveness of this procedure. So unroofing in this case is not effective and he leaves the, uh, the stenosis. So in this case, we have to uh, use another technique, which is most often the translocation of the coronary arteries. It can be done in different, in different way, but most often is like the trans translocation of the, of the reimplantation of the, of the switch. The, the French uh, school is actually uh, by Pascal Way. They were also uh, pro promoting a kind of procedure which is more aggressive in which you de definitely you enlarge the, the, the um, ostium and you correct the, the correct the anomaly in um, not only doing the roofing but also um, incising the proximal part of the coronary and enlarging the proximal part of the coronary with the pericardial patch. They, the, the, the French colleagues claim that this is gonna provoke, will produce a larger a larger um, or new orifice and it prevents from uh, problems of um, an effective roofing. However, the use of a patch is something that must be, could be concerned. Then in uh, some cases, especially in adults or old patients, the, uh, just a um, simple coronary artery bypass graft can be considered, especially in older patients with uh, associated coronary artery uh, disease. And in this case, what you have to remember is that you have to close the proximal part of the coronary to avoid competitive flow. And last, the anterior pulmonary translocation. Artery translocation is actually a procedure that has been promoted by the colleagues from Stanford, but is actually most often used as an, an uh, associate procedure, not the main procedure. The concept is that you just move away the pulmonary artery from the coronary, so you need more space in the coronary to be not compressed. But this relies on the on the concept of the squeezing, which is not exactly what is uh, um, the, the cause of the ischemia. Uh, in the case of the intracoronary transept of coronary, which is the one who goes uh, through the coronal septum, the repair is more tricky and more intriguing. Recently, Annie Najin from <coughs> Cleveland Clinic has described a very really interesting procedure, which most, what they do is actually to totally unroof the core, the anomalous coronary cords in this coronal septum, of cutting all the muscle, which uh, in this case, it acts like a long intra in a myocardial bridge. So opening up the part of the coronary and then let it uncompressed using a patch of pericardium, which is sutured in a particular way. In this way, the coronary is not compressed and is far away from the infundibulum. So, uh, some years ago, um, the European experience was focused on the results of surgery on anomalous coronary arteries. So we were able to collect 156 patients. This was a retrospective study with 156 patients. And what we found is that the majority were having an interarterial course, even if intramural course was not all. Uh, it was interesting to see that, of course, all these patients, the majority of patients at the uh, surgery were symptomatic. However, there was also some part which are no, no symptomatic at all. Um, it's important to recognize that the age were pretty, uh, pretty uh, various. But this was a, a series comprising either adults or pediatric patients. And uh, you can see the left coronary artery a left coronary artery originating from the anomalous uh, sinus uh, was operated much earlier compared to the other. As far as uh, intraoperative results, uh, we see that the unroofing procedure was the most common followed by the coronary implantation. Um, there were some complications, some major postoperative complications, especially in the left coronary anomaly. 
However, this compensation is always correlated, not, also, not, not only to the surgical procedure, but most often to the preoperative condition in this series. Mechanical support was uh, reported in 3.8%, and again, it was depending on the preoperative condition. And also, mortality was 1.4%. Again, patients who were arriving to the hospital in very, very bad conditions. What was important for the multivariate logistic regression is actually this, um, this uh, operation was uh, able to uh, push patients, especially the young patient, to return to sport. What is, why this is important? It's important because this means that this patient can return to a normal and restricted life, according to uh, in different countries' regulation. And also, unroofing in this series um, seem to be pretty effective and protective because it prevents compression during effort, relocates the, the orifice and appropriate sinus, and abolishes the interterial intramural course. Of course, this unroofing is supposed to be when the intramural course is long. So from this retrospective analysis, we could see that it's a safe procedure in a large sample, very low for the mortality rate of early complications, which are not, which are, are, are uh, present. The roofing and the corner implantation in this series were safest because they usually they had zero operative mortality. While the, uh, the, uh, the coronary artery bypass graft could be a good option for older patients. Most patients were surrendered asymptomatic postoperatively and athletes uh, could return to sports after surgery. However, the occurrence of late adverse events, surgical, non surgical, and surgical death is in this series is not negligible. And their conclusion was to uh, mandate that uh, long term surveillance is mandatory. So we can say that after this conclusion, the surgery could, seems to be safe. We don't know yet if it's effective. In fact, uh, as has been reported in the past, the restenosis of even sudden cardiac death can occur after operation. So we again, we unify again and we decide to compare the surgical group to a, a group of patients who was not treated. Uh, surgically. And what we found out is, of course, the intramural anatomy was more common in the in surgical patients. The anterior to the pulmonary, so the pre pulmonary uh, anatomic feature was most common in the medical patients. Symptoms in cardiac arrest were more common in surgical patients. Uh, both groups presented with similar preoperative sport activity. We compare so the results in a, in a follow up, which is not too long, but one to two years. And what we can see is uh, that the surgical patients uh, were performing sport in a more, uh, more often than the medical patients. So even in this case, we can say that the, the kind of, um, the kind of um, uh, quality of life of the, of the surgery is probably much better after surgery. However, the, the events are, um, are after surgery were not significantly different in this series from the medical patients. And during the inverse probability treatment weighting, the propensity score, we could uh, conclude again that a sport activity was greater in, uh, was a greater return to sport activity, so a restricted kind of life in the surgical patients. Of course, this, is a, this was a retrospective study, uh, so uh, the release that was not known and the duration of follow-up is very low. For this reason, uh, we still have in this, in this um, study and also in some other studies uh, around the world, an objective, a lack of objective evidence for elimination of ischemia in most patients. For this reason, we have designed a prospective multicenter study focused on identification of objective evidence of ischemia in medical and surgical patients with a minimum follow-up of five to 10 years in a commonly shared database. This is the so-called European Iraq registry, which is a European perspective registry that we started in February 1st, 2019. And this is a, a data, a database online, which is pretty easy to find also online, in which we excluded highly isolated day high takeoff. We excluded the outer and archipa and associated and the anomalies associated with major congenital heart disease. This is the kind of uh, form that you can see in which there's a lot of attention to the specific anatomy. And also the surgical, to those patients who were um, treated surgically, there's uh, also a, a report 
very detailed report on the anatomy of this kind of, of procedures. So far, we have uh, collected 12 tertiary centers in Europe, which are participating, and these sites are either cardiology or cardiac surgery centers. And these are over either pediatric or adult centers. So we have either adults and young, when you have patients in this registry. And we follow up this patient yearly, more or less, for at least five years. So far, we have collected 262 anomalies. And with a median age of 36 years old, ranging between 12 and 55. And again, the most common is the right artery coronary artery from the opposite sinus. And the majority has interterior cores, and about half are present with an intramural cores. What is interesting is that we can see that considering left coronary to right coronary, actually, there are not great differences as far as. Um, anatomy and actually the in the uh, right coronary the high risk anatomy were found even more often than in the left coronary artery so there must be attention also in the right coronary and not only on the left coronary in conclusion we we can see that nowadays among the monomous aortic coronary the right coronary is more frequent than the left coronary the surgical repair in generally safe with a low post-operative morbidity and is usually indicated according to related symptoms, both for the right or the left. And um, the most important thing that we're still missing in a, is a long follow-up that is still in progress. But what we see, what we've seen from the European prospective study is that still we have a wide variety of preoperative evaluation. We are very appealing according to central expertise. Some, some centers are very familiar with IBUS, some other not. Uh, still, there are no common post-operative follow-up strategy in Europe, but there's a standard of care which is profiling. The echocardiography is not yet a valid diagnostic technique everywhere, despite its real ability is improving due to increased cardiologists' awareness of the anomalous coronary artery existence. The, the um, CT scan is the gold standard, in, also for pediatric patients, thanks to the advanced technology that are residue the X-ray exposure. CMRI is mostly done in pediatric patients, but it's potentially very useful to evaluate fibrosis at follow-up. Thank you very much. This is our group, and I'm, I'm happy to answer to any question you may have.